Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, for another Midnight Mirage Classic History Lesson. Just want to salute for the people for tuning in. So in this lesson, what we will do is learn about some of the occult or hidden history of the American Civil War. We will learn about some of the hidden history as it concerns the American Civil War. All right. And we also will learn about how the Freemasons and the various secret societies played a part into, you know, the the explosion of what we would call later on the American Civil War and this conflict between various political parties, various secret society groups. But we will look into certain details that will, you know, highlight and show that there were Freemasons behind closed doors playing both sides of the checkerboard against each other. OK. Now, in, you know, the so-called public education system, they teach young people that the American Civil War was fought about or fought over, rather, so-called black Americans in the South who were so-called slaves um, being freed by the so-called Union Army. And the Union Army came into the South and went against the Confederates. And this is the background narrative that they give you on why the, the American Civil War took place. But what you will learn by the end of this video is, is that there were a lot of Freemasons that were on both sides, on the Union side and the Confederate side, that were abolitionists and that were also, you know, we'll say radical racists, that, you know, these Freemasons actually helped set up a lot of this conflict. Understand, people, that majority of the game of life is about power and leverage and control so when we hear about these wars and conflicts and some of these things that happen that seem to be very very funny and skeptical understand that somebody's going to be able to benefit and profit off of this in the end um for example let's take the the george floyd riots that took place a couple of summers ago in june you had a lot of people that were you know protesting across various you know states cities um and even in other countries and there were a lot of, you know, landmarks torn up, different stores, etc. But we have to remember that a lot of the people who had insurance policies and premiums on different property and resources um, and some of these stores that were destroyed, they were able to capitalize uh, from their insurance packages. OK, so it wouldn't be funny, you know, or too, you know, off the wall to say that a lot of the people that benefited from the insurance probably helped instigate some of the problems okay this is why you have a thing called insurance fraud when people you know create a situation only so they can capitalize off the insurance premiums and you even have you know um, law enforcement and certain insurance companies that will create investigations to make sure that these insurance claims are actually real and valid so understand that somebody is always benefiting benefiting and profiting off of the chaos okay and these groups that we know of as Freemasons and some of these other secret societies, a lot of the times, you know, they have their hands in it. And the American Civil War is no different. All right. So we're going to learn a little bit about that and get some of the details on this situation. So where I'm going to get my um, I'm coming out of a book that I have called Auto Ab K.O. by a man named David Livingston. It's called Auto Ab K.O. And he goes into, you know, some of this information on the Civil War and how the Freemasons played a part in it. So that's going to be my source that we're coming from. I also wanted to talk about this because now that we are in 2024, you know, we're going to have a different, um, a new presidential election coming up soon. All right. So you're going to see a lot of political campaigns coming from the left and the right, coming from the Republican and the Democratic parties. But. As I said, the Freemasons are behind closed doors and they're playing both sides of the checkerboard and they are instigating problems to get these two sides to fight against each other. And unfortunately, in this country, because this country is made up of people of various ethnicities, nationalities and cultures and religions, you know, there are a lot of differences here, we'll say. So it's very, very easy for Freemasons to get people that have these differences to fight against each other. So an example of that would be. The indigenous swore the copper colored Americans known as so-called black Americans and causing up, you know, issues and problems to get them to go against the European Caucasian foreigners who are United States citizens. So the Freemasons also capitalize off of what we call racism. OK. And, you know, what we're going to have to understand is it's kind of like in that in the um, movie they had on Netflix called Leave the World Behind. 
whenever some of these you know issues come to the forefront what people are going to have to do is is use discernment um your spiritual intuition and insight must be activated and we don't want to judge a person based on their ethnicity and nationality or religion because when you do that you plan into the hands of the freemasons and this is how they're able to profit capitalize and make millions and millions, if not billions of dollars off of these conflicts. OK, now, before we move forward. I want to say that, unfortunately, a lot of and I think a lot of them are waking up to this. But a lot of Caucasian United States citizens may not be aware of some of these strategies used by the Freemasons and some of these false biblical narratives, as we're going to see in a minute, how they were used to justify and, you know, rationalize treating people of color a certain way. All right. So the same way that we were lied to as indigenous American or so-called black American people, European, Caucasian, United States citizens, they were lied to as well. All right. It's just we were lied to for different reasons. OK, but as I said, the Freemasons behind closed doors and those that are part of, you know, the shadow societies, they benefited off of it regardless. All right. Um, another thing I want to drop on you real quick. So something that's, you know, you're going to hear me talk about a little bit. It's something called the Southern strategy. All right. The Southern strategy and the Southern, the Southern strategy is basically something that Caucasian United States citizens have used in particular politicians when they go on their campaigns, whether they are Democratic or Republican, because remember that the original Democratic Party was the party of the Ku Klux Klan, um, as we're going to see a little bit in a minute. And during the late 50s and throughout the 60s, a lot of those Caucasian Democratic Party members, they switched over to the Republican Party. OK, so keep that in mind that the original Democratic Party, a lot of those members throughout the 50s and the 60s, they switched over to what we call the Republican Party. So what you all consider as, you know, an ultra conservative right wing, radical, racist Republican Party. Um, like, for example, the, the John Birch Society that was created in the late 1950s, um, you know, and of course you had your um, your Nixon era and just throughout the 50s, 60s and 70s, what you all consider to be the quote unquote racist right. This once used to be the racist left. So, as I said, the Freemasonry, it's on both sides. It's on the black and the white side of the checkerboard. OK. And the Southern strategy is a dog whistle strategy that is used as a political template to gain votes. Donald Trump used this for his election a couple of years ago, and he's going to use it again for this election coming up. But the Southern strategy is basically when you have these, you know, racist politicians and they'll say things like, well, we're going to cut welfare back and, and, and we're going to cut back on food stamps and stuff like that. When the Caucasian masses hear that they know that that's a dog whistle for saying that we're going to cut back on giving resources to so-called black americans and because we in this politically correct age they can't come out with those old racist you know statements like they would have done in the early 20th century where a lot of these politicians would come out using the n-word especially those that were from the south and they would use that to get votes and it will work but now it's more of a politically correct environment it doesn't mean that they still aren't racist and xenophobic but they do it more through dog whistling now. So they'll say things like we're going to put up a border and keep all the immigrants out. And, you know, as I said, we're going to cut back on food stamps and we're going to cut back on welfare in Section 8. When a lot of the Caucasian masses hear that, they calculate that as, OK, we're going to cut back on giving so-called blacks resources. So, you know, I'm going to vote for this politician. All right. And as I said, all Caucasian people may not be bad, but this is just a strategy that they use or at least their leadership. So, as I said, the book I'm reading from is called Auto Ab Kao by David Livingston. And we're going to read in his chapter on the American Civil War. All right. So we started on the chapter and his first bullet point is called Dixieland. The curse of Ham, the controversial rabbinical interpretation of the Bible, became the basis for the subjugation of African slaves ultimately creating an ideological divide that resulted in the American Civil War of 1861 to 1865 and persists to this day, serving as the basis for the Southern strategy. The Curse of Ham also received the support of Freemasonry, where it served to justify the exclusion of blacks. 
The first justification was articulated in Anderson's Constitutions of 1923, where he outlined the legends of Freemasonry as well as, as well as its regulations or charges, including the quote ancient landmarks. Among these landmarks was the requirement that a candidate for Freemasonry quote must be good and true men, freeborn and of mature and discreet age. No bond men, no women, no immoral or scandalous men, but of good report, end quote. So before we continue, let's analyze this real quick. So it says right here that the curse of Ham, the controversial rabbinical interpretation of the Bible, became the basis for the subjugation of so-called African slaves and created an ideological divide that resulted in the American Civil War of 1861 to 1865 and persists to this day serving as the basis for the southern strategy so as i said a lot of us that you know have aboriginal american ancestry you are coming into the enlightenment that the narrative of us all being from africa and brought over here on boats chained up and forced into you know perpetual servitude in the 1600s a lot of that is not true a lot of a majority of our ancestry was already here in the americas but what is true is is that you had a lot of Eastern European, uh, Caucasian Jewish people who I believe at this time period may have had, you know, a little bit of um, power and prominence from them living under the melanated Israelites of Europe and some of the Protestant melanated people of Europe. So when they came to the Americas, you know, they had already been doing business with some of the Moroccan empires and some of the Muslims. So they were already into what we'll call um, human trafficking, a.k.a human slavery when you think about the ottoman or the osman ali harems where a lot of the eastern orthodox christian women of europa and through these you know different campaigns where there were wars you know a lot of the women were taken and made captives and they were sold off into the slave markets and eventually they would end up in the harems of a lot of these moorish you know empires um, of northwest africa the levant and all throughout europa but what a lot of us don't know is that there were Eastern European Ashkenazim who acted as like the intermediate or who acted as like brokers in a lot of these so-called slave deals. So, yes, the Ashkenazim of Eastern European or the Caucasian converts into Judaism, they did play a part into what we call, you know, so-called slavery. All right. So keep that in mind. And a lot of their leadership, the rabbis, they used the justification of the curse of Ham to actually, you know, substantiate why they treated the melanated people the way they did. Now, for those of us that may not understand biblical history, the curse of Ham is goes back to Genesis, where we learn about Noah and his three sons. And apparently the way the story is, is that when Noah was in a drunken state, that his son Ham saw his nakedness, quote unquote, whatever that may really mean. And through him seeing his nakedness, Ham was cursed through his offspring, Canaan, all right, by Noah, his father, all right. And he basically said that Canaan would be a servant of the Ham, of Ham's brothers, all right. So when these later day converts into Judaism and Christianity that were Caucasians, when they came across this information, they chose to use this to justify how they treated a lot of the melanated people of, of Northwest Africa, the so-called Middle East, Europa, and then later on, the Americas. Okay? So keep in mind that, yes, it was the Spanish Inquisition that kicked out a lot of the Israelites from Europa. Yes, it was the Jacobite Wars when Oliver Cromwell and some of those Caucasian Jewish people that were working with him kicked out the melanated people of what we know of today as the British Isles. But this curse of Ham was the justification for it. And I also want you to think about this. Noah was a melanated man and his three sons were all melanated. OK, so that false, you know, narrative that they put out that Ham was so-called black that, you know, Shem was, I guess, a, a mulatto or Middle Eastern looking man. OK, and Japheth was a Caucasian. That is not true. OK, that is not true. The truth is, is that they were all melanated. And that. 
the so-called black American is not a Hamite, meaning that if you come, if, it, if you're using biblical terminology and you're going to try to trace the lineage of who we call today the so-called black American, the so-called black American is Shemitic. And a lot of the people on the continent of Africa, although you have Shemitic people there, but predominantly they are Hamitic. OK, so there is a difference between Shemitic people of color and Hamitic people of color. An example of this would be Moses. OK, Moses was a Shemitic man. He was from the tribe of Levi, who were Israelites that descended from Abraham and Shem. But notice how Noah grew up around the Hamitic Mizraim or the Hamitic Egyptians. And Noah's and, and Moses, his whole life, he thought he was Hamitic or uh, an Egyptian until he found out that he wasn't and that he actually was Shemitic. And then he went on his journey, of course, to figure out who he is. And then later, later on to come and free his people of bondage. I want you to think about um, the prophet Yeshua or who we know of as Jesus and how some of the Roman leadership were very, very terrified of there being an Israelite reformist coming and destroying Rome and kicking them out. So they were trying to find various babies who may be, you know, this, this, this spoken of Israelite Messiah. So to evade that, uh, baby Yeshua and his parents Mary they went and hid into a, another nation they went and hid into Egypt now if they were a Caucasian people they would have been very very easy to point out but they were not so yes the Hamitic people and the Shemitic people are both melanated or so-called black people or indigenous to the earth but that doesn't mean they come from the same tribe I think it may be the Zondervan dictionary if I'm if I can remember correctly but there is also information out that when you start to look up, you know, um, the origins of the Shemitic and the Hamitic ethnic groups, they will let you know that the Hamitic ethnic groups are put Canaan, Cush and Mizraim, but not the Negro. OK, so they let you know that, yes, the Hamite Ham is the progenitor of Mizraim or Egypt, the Cushites, put and Canaan. But he is not the progenitor of the Negro. OK, so understand that that term Negro is another synonym for Afro-Asiatic, which is another synonym for Shemitic. So when these later on Ashkenazim rabbis, you know, chose to use the curse of Ham to, to, to justify treating our people a certain way, you know, they were wrong and they knew that. But this is what they used. So that whole curse of Ham originally started with these Eastern European converts into Judaism, their rabbinical leadership, you know, using that to justify the way they treated our people through the Intercatera, um, through the Inquisition and the other things that happened to our, we'll say, cousin ethnic group that was in Europa, the Negro Shemitic people of Europa. They used that over there with them. So when they came to the Americas and they found this same um, indigenous American who, who they also deem to be a Negro, they use the same thing against our people here. Okay, so let's continue. So it says, according to the constitutions, it says, quote, no doubt Adam taught his sons geometry and the use of it and the several art and crafts convenient, at least for those early times. For Cain, we find, built the city, which he called consecrated or dedicated after the name of his eldest son, Enoch, and becoming the prince of the one half of mankind, his posterity would imitate his royal example in approving both the noble science and the useful art. Noah and his three sons, Japheth, Shem, and Ham, all masons true, brought with them over the flood the traditions and arts of the antediluvians and amply communicated them to their growing offspring okay let's continue however as noted by michael w homer lawrence dermott the first grand secretary of the rival grand lodge of antients organized in london in 1751 and who took a design by rabbi leon templo as the basis for his coat of arms, published Ahiman Rezo, a history which provided one of the foundations upon which some American Masons 
could rationalize that Ham's descendants, who they believed were black, were ineligible to join their lodges. According to Lawrence Dermott, he states, It is certain that Freemasonry has existed from the creation, though probably not under that name, that it was a divine gift from God, that Cain and the builders of his city were strangers to the secret mystery of Masonry, that there were but four Masons in the world when the deluge happened, that one of the four, even the second son of Noah, was not a master of the art. So now what we're looking at is, is why there is a distinction and a divide between the Caucasian skull and bones, the Caucasian Scottish Rite Freemasonry, which I believe was started in South Carolina, while you have Caucasian Shriners and Freemasons in, on one side, but then on the other side, you have what we know of as Sigma Pi Phi, Sigma Pi Phi or the Boule. And you have the Prince Hall Freemasons, which are so-called black American men and the so-called Shriners that are so-called black American men. And also the Eastern Stars, which are so-called black American females. But in other words, why the Freemasoning Lodges are racially divided. The reason why is because. The Caucasian Jewish and Caucasian Christian United States citizens, you know, based on the false history that they were given, they think that so-called black Americans are Hamitic and that they are subject to the curse of Ham. So because of that, they have a divide in their lodges. All right, let's continue. Quote, in antebellum America, according to David Goldenberg, the curse of Ham was, quote, the single greatest justification for maintaining black slavery and for keeping that social order in place for centuries. Pre-Civil War Americans regarded Southerners as a distinct people who possessed their own values and way of life. During the three decades leading up to the Civil War, popular writers created a stereotype now known as, quote, the plantation legend that described the South as a land of aristocratic planters, Southern bales and devoted household slaves. This image of the South as, quote, a land of cotton where old times are not forgotten was popularized, popular, popularized, excuse me, in 1859 in a song called Dixie, written by a northerner named Dan D. Emmett, probably the best known song to have come out of blackface minstrelsy. Emmett adopted the tune for a pseudo African American spiritual in the 1870s or 1880s. Blackface performers added their own versions or own verses or altered the song. The chorus changed to, quote, I wish I was in Canaan, end quote. So, you know how you hear that term, a Dixiecrat, when they're talking about those uh, Southern racist, antebellum people in the South? Well, you know, remember, as I said, a lot of some of the history can be confusing because the people that owned the land in the South, the majority of people were the indigenous Americans. And you had a lot of melanated American people and melanated Europeans who owned slaves that could have been so-called black or so-called white. But it did get to a point where when the Caucasian people consolidated amongst themselves, that a lot of the forced servitude, what we would call slavery, it became, you know, ethnic or racially based. All right. Another thing I want to note, too, is, is that a lot of what we call so-called slavery, these really were just poor labor contracts. Let me repeat that. A lot of what we call slavery, these were poor labor contracts. All right. Poor labor contracts. Basically, like how today you have the so-called rappers and they sign those bad um, 360 deals. And then we say that they end up in a slave deal. Well, that's what was going on also during the 1800s. Some of our people that had may have been denationalized and lost resources and maybe they were looking for work. A lot of them were given these poor, bad labor contracts. OK, that we know of as sharecropping, for example. So a lot of this is also what they call slavery or also indentured servitude. So a lot of times when you see it associated with the Caucasian, they call it indentured servitude. But when you see it associated with. Um, the so-called black American is called slavery, but it's really the same system. It's, it's poor labor contracts. OK, working for basically pennies on the dollars or really damn near nothing. OK. So let's continue. 
Now, this part is very, very critical. I want you to get to listen to because now we're going into a lot of the Freemasons that were behind closed doors. In the United States, Giuseppe Mazzini spearheaded a plan and lead with the Rothschilds to foment the Civil War along the divide of the volatile issue of race. Central to this plan, reports Hager, was the Rothschild family. The Mazzini Rothschild conspiracy devolved from Southern Jewish community networked with secret societies of the Skull and Bones, the Knights of the Golden Circle, and the Ku Klux Klan, who were inspired by the vigilantism of the Holy Vim, who advanced that cause of slave ownership against the abolitionists of the North. So let me reread this part, because this is very powerful. Because now we're learning about some of these Freemasonic agents behind closed doors that instigated the Civil War. It says in the United States, Giuseppe Mazzini, who was born in 1805 and he died in 1872. It said Giuseppe Mazzini spearheaded a plan in league with the Rothschilds to foment the American Civil War along the divide of the volatile issue of race central to this plan was the Rothschild family. The Mazzini Rothschild conspiracy devolved from Southern Jewish community network with secret societies of the Skull and Bones, the Knights of the Golden Circle, and the Ku Klux Klan, who advanced that cause of slave ownership against the abolitionists of the North. So there was a man named Giuseppe Mazzini, who was a European, and he was working in tandem with some of the Rothschilds. Now, in a little while, we're going to learn that Rothschild wanted to create another central bank. But these were some of the people behind closed doors cooking up these problems that will later on create the Civil War. All right. And they worked through the secret societies known as the Skull and Bones, the Knights of the Golden Circle, also who we know of as the Ku Klux Klan. OK, so when they will show you the Knight Riders of the Ku Klux Klan, you know, a bunch of, you know, country Caucasian men on horses burning down villages and will, will try to hang a so-called black man. What they don't let you know is that a lot of them were Freemasons and that their leaders were those wearing suits. And they were high level politicians and businessmen throughout the South. And a lot of them came from the Southern Jewish community. OK, let's continue. So it says this, I'm going to reread this sentence. It says the Mazzini Rothschild conspiracy devolved from Southern Jewish community network with secret societies of the Skull and Bones, Knights of the Golden Circle and the Ku Klux Klan who advanced the cause of slave ownership against the abolitionists of the North. The Supreme Council, ancient and accepted Scottish Rite, Southern jurisdiction, commonly known as the Mother Supreme Council of the World, founded in Charleston in 1801, was headed by Albert Pike, who headed the super right of Freemasonry known as the Palladian Rite with Mazzini. So let's reread this last sentence. It says that the Supreme Council, ancient and accepted Scottish Rite, Southern Jurisdiction, commonly known as the Mother Supreme Council of the World, founded in 1801 Charleston, was headed by Albert Pike, who is the gentleman you see on the screen in front of you, who, he who headed the super right of Freemasonry known as the Palladian Rite with Giuseppe Mazzini. So Albert Pike and Giuseppe Mazzini and Rothschild helped create Scottish Rite Freemasonry in 1801 in Charleston, South Carolina. So a lot of the Caucasian Europeans that started to join Freemasonry, they, they, they join it through what they know of as the Southern Jurisdiction or the Palladian Rites of the Southern Jurisdiction. Now, the Palladian Rite is basically one of the higher orders of Freemasonry that Albert Pike introduced. Albert Pike is actually the one that added a lot of the occultic, esoteric themes to Freemasonry. And he's the one that really, you know, as we would say here in Atlanta, sauced it up or piped it up. He's the one that actually gave it the seasoning salt and the flair that it has today. So when you all think about like the Illuminati and, and you know, the idea of them worshiping the Baphomet or worshiping Lucifer and the one eye symbolism um, and some of that different stuff. A lot of that, those esoteric codes and a lot of that esoteric um, tradition 
was added by Mazzini, Albert Pike, and the Rothschilds. Now, a little bit, and I've talked about this in prior tapes, but the Rothschilds, along with a lot of other families, were actually Sabbatean Frankists, or they were heretical Jews. Let me say that one more time. The Rothschilds, along with a lot of other families from Europe, they were Sabbatean Frankists or heretical Jews. There was a man from Turkey named Sabbatai V. OK. And in 1666, the year 1666. He had declared himself to be the, you know, awaited for Jewish Messiah. And from some of the things that I look at, it said that half of the world's Jewish population actually believed he had he was the Messiah. And you also will find out that a lot of the Rosicrucians who were some of the um, Knights Templar and some of those people from Christendom that learned about the Palladian Rite and learned about those ancient, you know, Babylonian tr customs from what they know of as the Eastern mystics. OK, and the Eastern mystics, basically, a lot of them were Sufic Shia Muslims that were from Iran. So they were basically heretical Muslims. So understand that in Freemasonry, you have a relationship between heretical Christians, heretical Muslims and heretical Jews. And all of them are under what we know of as the Kabbalah. And also Neoplatonism, Hermeticism and Gnosticism. Let me say that again. So a lot of these heretical Jews that are known as the Sabbatean Frankists. That are behind what you all know of as the Illuminati. Um, you got to remember that all Caucasian Jewish people are not bad people. Not all Caucasian Jewish people believe in the Talmud. And not all Caucasian Jewish people are racist. As the same for Caucasian Christians and pale Arabs. But you had certain heretical groups that broke away from those systems. Such as a lot of the Shia and the Sufic orders that started to implement a lot of the Babylonian ancient Canaanite customs, all right, also known as the um, Ismail, Ismailis or the Assassins. You had a lot of them and a lot of those um, heretical Muslims, a lot of those Shia Sufi um, mystics that were coming from like Iran, Persia, um, Iraq, coming from that region. A lot of them actually were who the Knights Templars met up with when they started to, you know, come into the Holy Land or come into the Levant through what we call the Holy Crusades. Because they always tell you that the Rosicrucians or the Knights Templars, when they came to capture Jerusalem, that they came across these Eastern mystics that taught them the, the worship of the Baphomet or that taught them the Palladian Rite. And I'm telling you right now that the people that taught them that were these Sufic, Shia, heretical Muslims. And some of them were, you know, they were from Iran um, in various parts. Of, of the so-called Middle East, but that is who actually taught them the Kabbalah. Now, going back to Sabbatai V, he was a heretical Jew from Turkey. But what ended up happening was that the the um, the Sultan of the empire, um, the Islamic empire told him, they said, look, either you convert into Islam or we're going to kill you. So what Sabbatai V decided to do was is he converted into Islam. So you had a Caucasian Jewish person, or he could have been a melanated man, but he converted into Islam and he was known as a crypto Jew. The same thing that a lot of the, 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 the Israelites did in the Iberian Peninsula from the Spanish Inquisition that we know of as the Moranos. OK, so the Moranos were really Israelite people who still were practicing their own religion, but they did it in secrecy. And in the public, they acted like they were Catholic Christians. Well, this is the same thing that happened with the um, Islamic community in Turkey as well. The followers of Sabbatai V, a lot of them converted into Islam as well. So you have a lot of people today that you may think are, are Arab, but they come from Kabbalistic, Sabbatean, um, uh, Jewish families, believe it or not. But publicly, they look like they're Islamic or Muslim. Okay. And what brings them all together is the Kabbalah. All right. Now, I just wanted to talk about that a little bit so you'll understand when it says that. That ancient and accepted Scottish Rite Southern jurisdiction was founded in Charleston in 1801 and was headed by Albert Pike, who.
who headed the super right of Freemasonry known as the Palladian Rite with Giuseppe Mazzini. And the Palladian Rite is basically the worship of Baphomet, um, human sacrifice, the Eucharist, and all that other craziness that they're into. All right. So let's continue. It says, despite having been defeated in the War of 1812 and having signed a non-aggression treaty of 1814, Britain still longed to return America to its rule, as explained Nicholas Hager. Quote, through the Scottish Rite lodges of the English obedience in the north, it controlled northeastern wealth, but could not control the south as southern wealth was measured in slaves. If Britain was to have economic control over the south, slavery would have to be abolished. And so a plan was devised to, to divide America over the slavery issue in the hope that America could be controlled economically and financially, if not militarily. So let's reread this one more time. It says. Through the Scottish Rite lodges of the English. Through the Scottish Rite lodges of the English obedience in the north. It controlled northeastern wealth, but could not control the south as southern wealth was measured in slaves. So even though after the war of 1812 was over, you still had certain British, you know, diplomats that wanted to control the United States. And they still had a foothold and they had a control in the northeastern regions that we know of as like Boston, Massachusetts, Connecticut and that region. Right. And they were controlling it through the Freemasonic lodges. That's why you'll hear about during the American Revolutionary War, the War of 1812. You'll still hear about these, you know, uh, American colonists that were still working for Britain. And they did it in secrecy because they were all part of certain Freemasonic lodges. And it says that if Britain was to have economic control over the South, that slavery would have to be abolished. So now you see how Britain had an interest in slavery being abolished. OK, so they could have economic control. All right. So let's continue. Very important on this right here. The Rothschilds funding of the North was conducted through August Belmont, who was born in 1813 and died in 1890. James Rothschild controlled the South via the Rothschild agent Judah P. Benjamin, who was born in 1811 and died in 1884, a Southern lawyer and politician who came to be known as, quote, the Jewish Confederate. Benjamin was the most prominent Jewish plantation owner, having built the Bell Chassis Plantation in Plaque Mines Parish and owning 140 slaves. So let's read this again. The Rothschild's funding of the North was conducted through August Belmont. James Rothschild controlled the South via the Rothschild agent Judah P. Benjamin, a Southern lawyer and politician who came to be known as the Jewish Confederate. Benjamin was the most prominent Jewish plantation owner, having built Bell Chase Plantation and Plaque Mines Parish and owned 140 slaves. Now, something very, very interesting about this man named Judah P. Benjamin is that I've come across information in books that described him as a swarthy man. So I've come across books that actually describe Judah P. Benjamin as a so-called black man. So that's why a lot of this history is kind of tricky. And, you know, our generation probably won't be able to do it. But our future generations, when they have the resources and time to investigate our history thoroughly, we'll be able to really find out the true ethnicities of some of these people involved. Because some of the pictures of Judah P. Benjamin I've seen, he was Caucasian. And some of the pictures of Judah P. Benjamin, not even pictures, but descriptions of him, rather. He was described as a melanated man. Also the same for um, the Confederate general. What was his name? I want to say it was either Robert E. Lee. Or one of them, but some of them, a lot of them were described as so-called black men, too. So keep in mind that you had a lot of so-called black Confederates that had power in the South and they wanted to keep it. So some of them were also involved in this. So although I may be calling this person a Jewish person, but this could be a melanated, swarthy Israelite. And they could have been, you know, professing and acting like they were Christian, but they really weren't. Or they could have been acting like they were Protestant or acting like they were Baptist, but they really weren't. OK, so keep that in mind. But it says that the Rothschilds funded the North 
through their agent, August Belmont, who was a Jew from Germany. And that the Rothschild controlled the South through Judah B. Benjamin. So remember, like I told you, the Freemasons, they play both sides of the checkerboard. So Rothschild financed the North and the South in the in the Civil War. These are the same things that they do today. They, they play both sides of the fence. OK, and Albert Pike was working in tandem with Judah P. Benjamin. All right. Let's continue. It says, as observed by Furelich, whether so many Southern Jews would have achieved so high a level of social, political, economic and intellectual status and recognition without the presence of the lowly and degraded slave is indeed dubious. How ironic that the distinction bestowed upon Jewish men like Judah P. Benjamin were in some measure dependent upon the sufferings of Negro slaves they bought and sold. So, you know, this is what I meant by when I was saying that a lot of the Caucasian Jewish converts had their hands in what we know of as the American so-called slave trade or human trafficking. They've been involved in it since working with the Ottoman Empire over in the Levant, over in Southern Europe, and over in Eastern Europe, before it came to the Americas. And yes, there were Caucasian converts into Judaism during that time period. There were. All right. Now, if you were to ask me, were some of the swarthy or so-called black Israelites working with the Ashkenazim converts? I would say they probably were. All right. So whether Judah P. Benjamin was a melanated man or whether he was an Ashkenazim, to me, it doesn't really matter. The history is still the same. But I just did want, want you to know that, you know, I've come across information that that he was um, described as a person of color, too. OK. And remember that a lot of the Caucasian Slavs or Slavics that were on the feudal system in Europe, they were also slaves here in the Americas. They just call them indentured servitude servitudes, but they, they was indentured servants, rather, excuse me, but they were slaves. OK. Because remember, the term slave originally is a Slovenian or a Slavic, a person of Eastern European descent. As far as that term slave being applied to anybody that's been put into um, forced servitude, that came later on. But the reason why that term Slavic or slave has that um, that association is because the original Slavic or the original slave were the Caucasian pale people of, of, of Europe that were on, under the feudal system, the Circassians and, you know, etc. Okay. Let's continue. As indicated by Furelich, despite all the abolitionist activities of Jews in the North, slavery had been implanted and nourished by Northern merchants, both Christian and Jewish. During the 18th century, Jews actively traded in slaves with some running the slave markets. Therefore, as noted by George Cohen, quote, it is hardly surprising that they became a staunch upholders of the slavery system in their unwillingness to, relin to relinquish these personal benefits, end quote. The most dominant Jewish slave traders on the American continent, including Isaac da Costa of Charleston, South Carolina in the 1750s, David Franks of Philadelphia, in the 1760s and Aaron Lopez of Newport in the late 1760s and early 1770s. Jacob Rader Marcus, a historian and reform rabbi, wrote in his four volume history of American Jews that over 75 percent of Jewish families in Charleston, South Carolina, Richmond, Virginia and Savannah, Georgia owned slaves and nearly 40% of Jewish households across the country did. So, that's some very, very powerful information right there. Just showing you that the so-called Jewish convert had his hand in slavery. He was involved in it. Let's continue. As revealed in the Financial Times, Nathan, Nathan Meyer Rothschild and James William Freshfield, founder of Freshfields, Benefited financially from slavery as records from the National Archives show, even though both have often been portrayed as opponents of slavery. Remember, like I told you, the Rothschilds, they play both sides of the checkerboard. On August 3rd, 1835, in the city of London, 
Two years after the passing of the Slavery Abolition Act, Nathan Meyer Rothschild and his brother-in-law, Moses Montefiore, came to an agreement with the Chancellor of the Executor to issue one of the largest loans in history to finance the slave compensation package required by the 1833 Act. The two bankers agreed to loan the British government 15 million, with the government adding an additional 5 million later. The total sum represented 40% of the government's yearly income at the time, equivalent to some 300 billion today. It was the biggest bailout of an industry as a percentage of annual government expenditure, dwarfing the rescue of the banking sector in 2008. So what, 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 what the author is saying right here is, is that on August 3rd of 1835 in the city of London, two years after the passing of the Slavery Abolition Act, that Nathan Meyer Rothschild and his brother-in-law came to an agreement with the chancellor to issue one of the largest loans in history to finance the slave compensation package required by the 1833 Act. So the same way how when the banks failed, um not too long ago or like like i'll give you an example so when they when these banks fail and then you'll have what they call a government bailout that's when the government will come in and finance the banks or they will replace that money that was lost so they could stay in business well the same thing happened during so-called slavery when the british started to pass these laws that quote-unquote abolished slavery a lot of these plantation owners or so-called slaveholders bondsmen or bondholders rather they were compensated by the government. All right. So Nathan Meyer Rothschild, he was actually compensated because he was one of these slave owners. So not only was he part of the financier activities of providing the money or providing the loan to the British government so they could pay off these so-called slave owners. But he was also one of the slave owners that received some of the money. This is why I say that they play in both sides of the checkerboard. All right. Let's continue. The money was not paid back by the British taxpayers until 2015. So this this act was paid. This act was passed in 1833. OK, but remember, when the government passes certain things, the taxpayers are the one that have to eventually pay this thing back. So they passed this in 1833. And it says that the money wasn't fully paid back by the British taxpayers until 2015. That's some heavy stuff. The funds were not intended as reparations to the free slaves to redress the injustices they'd suffered. Instead, the money went exclusively to the owners of the slaves who were being compensated for the loss of what they had until then been considered their property. So, you know, when they talk about the um, the Freedmen's Bureau and here in the United States, when so-called slavery ended and a lot of the money and the investments that was supposed to be put up to compensate the so-called black Americans that had been um, denationalized so they could get back, get back on their feet. They could get the 40 acres and a mule. A lot of that money through backdoor Freemasonic deals ended up in the accounts of the so-called slaveholders, whether they were so-called black or white. It really don't matter. But the money never went to the freed people. It never went to the free men and women. It went to the so-called slave owners. OK. Let me reread this sentence. It says the funds, meaning that the funds that were supposed to be put up after so-called slavery was ended to give to the freed men and women. It said the funds were not intended as reparations to the freed slaves to redress the injustices they suffered. Instead, the money went exclusively to the owners of slaves who were being compensated for the loss of what they had. Until then, been considered their property. Because remember, they were looking at so-called slaves as like property. So when this property was lost, they were bailed out by the government and some of these international bankers. And then the debt was paid by your common taxpayer. It says, according to the legacies of British slave ownership at the University College London, Rothschild himself was a successful claimant under the scheme as part of Antigua 390. Matthews or Constitution Hill, where he was a beneficiary as mortgage holder to a plantation in Antigua, which had 158 slaves in his ownership. He received two thousand five hundred and seventy one dollars payment at the time worth two hundred and forty six thousand in two thousand and twenty. 
So as I told you all, you know, some of the insurance brokers, some of the people that were financing the mortgages for these plantations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There were the international bankers such as Rothschild and them. So they were they were double dipping. You know what I'm saying? Like Rothschild got paid off of financing the money to the British government and the British government has to pay him back plus interest. And then he benefited from being a so-called mortgage holder, so-called slave holder from the compensation packages. This shit is still going on to this day. This is why so-called black Americans probably won't ever get reparations. I'm going to leave it at that. Let me keep going. Listen up. The Rothschilds wanted to start a central bank in America. Now you now you're getting into why the Rothschilds were so involved in this. Now you're starting to see what the Rothschilds were going to get out of this. Their inclusion in the Civil War. The Rothschilds wanted to start a central bank in America. The second America created by James Madison in 1816 had collapsed in 1836. Nathan Meyer Rothschild's son, Lionel Rothschild, and his uncle, James, were behind the funding of both North and South in the planned division. The North was to be annexed to Canada as a British colony under Lionel, who was based in London. In 1851, Giuseppe Mazzini began the process of bringing about a civil war by forming revolutionary groups throughout the United States to intensify the debate on slavery. In 1857, a meeting in London convened by Mazzini's Illuminati decided that there should be a conflict between North and South, and Lionel Rothschild used August Belmont as an emissary together with Jay Cook, the Seligman Brothers, and Spire and Company. So let's go from this from the top. It says that the Rothschilds wanted to start a central bank in America. In America, Remember, the Rothschilds were being based out of London. So they wanted to put a central bank in America to get the United States into debt with them. All right. It says that Nathan Meyer Rothschild's son, Lionel Rothschild, and his uncle James were behind the funding of both the North and the South in the planned division. Remember, this was a Freemasonic conspiracy to divide the North and the South politically. So the Rothschilds could sneak in, give all these loans, and then now it's a central bank and now the whole country is in debt to them. It says the North was to be annexed to Canada as a British colony under Lionel, who was based in London. In 1851, Giuseppe Mazzini began the process of bringing about a civil war by forming revolutionary groups throughout the United States to intensify the debate on slavery. Now, let me ask you this. What are one of these revolutionary groups that you know of that were intensifying the racial issues in the South? The Ku Klux Klan. So this is why I said earlier that Rothschild, Mazzini, and Albert Pike, the Knights of the Golden Circle, the Skull and Bones, the Southern Jurisdiction of Charleston, South Carolina, Scottish Rite Freemasonry, that they were financing and going to a lot of these poor Caucasian people in the South and, and, and instigating them and putting a battery in their back and piping them up to make them think that they needed to fight to keep the people enslaved. So the Ku Klux Klan and all your poor, educated, un uneducated white trash, they were lied to by these elitist Jewish elitist Christian bankers. And that's why they would go out and just randomly and, and or even they would have targets and go and kill this so-called black man. So they would do shit like knowing damn well that over, in, let's say, uh, uh, Birmingham, Alabama, that it may be a descendant of the ancient Mississippian kingdom that still lives there. And let's say 1795, but they got to topple him in order to get power. So what these elitist Freemasons would do is go and find backwoods, uneducated, you know what I'm saying, disenfranchised Caucasian people who probably were descendants of um, indentured servants living in trailers and stuff like that, missing teeth. And they would tell them that, hey, look, you see these melanated Indians over there, their own land that got all these plantations and stuff like that. Y'all need to go against them. And when y'all go against them and take them out, we're going to allow y'all to stay on the land. So a lot of these poor Caucasians in the South that were Christian, they believed it. And they justified it by telling them that curse of Ham lie 
And they sent them out there with them white hoods on to do what they did. So don't think that every time you saw those hanging pictures that these were just some random so-called black men and random so-called black women. These were the emperors and empresses that actually still was running shit in the South that were descendants of the ancient Mississippians because that was the last American Indian, we'll say, kingdom that was in the Southeast before everything went to shit. So they would send them in to kill the people. And then next thing you know, now these Caucasian people on the land. All right, that's how that came to be. So now we're going to get ready to wrap it up. Now, I remember I told you that Lionel Rothschild used August Belmont as an agent in the North for the abolitionist. And he used Judah P. Benjamin as an agent in the South for the radical racist. OK, so remember Rothschilds, they were financing agents in the North who were abolitionists and they were financing agents in the South who would later on become the Ku Klux Klan. OK. August Belmont, whose real name was August Schoenberg, was a German born Jew who would become party chairman of the Democratic National Committee during the 1860s and the founder of the Belmont Stakes, third leg of the Triple Crown series of American horse racing. Belmont began his first job as an apprentice to the Rothschild baking firm in Frankfurt. In 1837, he set sail for Havana where he was charged with the Rothschild's interest in the Spanish colony of Cuba. In the financial recession and panic of 1837, like hundreds of American businesses, the Rothschild's American agent in New York City collapsed. As a result, Belmont stayed in New York and began a new firm, August Belmont and Company, and restored the Rothschild's wealth. So this guy, August Belmont, was a German-born Jew whose real name was Schoenberg, because remember, like I told you, like a lot of these, you know, whether they were melanated, full blooded Shemitic Israelites, they converted into other religions and they were crypto Israelites. And then you had the Eastern European Ashkenazim converts and they were crypto Jews converted into other religions, but they would change their last names. OK, so a lot of what they would do is change the last name so you wouldn't know who they really were, because ethnically. Caucasian Christian people and Caucasian Jewish people, they ethnically come from the same group. They both come from the, the, the Neanderthal tribes of Central Asia. OK. The steps in the hills of Central Asia, they come from both of those groups. So what they would do is they would just change their last name. So instead of calling himself August Schoenberg, he would call himself August Belmont. And that's where you get the Belmont Stakes. All right. The Triple Crown series of American horse racing. So now when you know about the Belmont Stakes, this was named by August Belmont, who was a German born Jew, and he was a financial agent of the Rothschild. OK, so this is some of the behind the, the scenes shit that was going on to, you know, create what we would later on know of as the American Civil War between the so-called abolitionist and the so-called uh, slaveocracy that was in the South. Whether it was melanated or whether it was Caucasian, you know, but what I can tell you is, is this. And we'll end it. The power started with the melanated swarthy Israelites of Europa and the Americas. And it started with the indigenous copper colored Mississippian landowners that hold that held the allodial titles. So we started with the power. But understand that, you know, some of us through the freed and accepted Masonic system, we started to empower these. You know, Slavic people that were coming out of the, you know, Central Asia. All right. And that's why they call it free and accepted masonry. You ever wonder why they call it freed and accepted masonry? Who was freed and who was accepted? The people that were freed were the Caucasians. And they were accepted by the melanated people of Europa who were known as the so-called black nobility. And that's how they were first taught Rosicrucianism. That's how they were first taught the Kabbalah. That's how they were first taught the Palladian rites. All this stuff was started by so-called black people. Okay. So we just wanted to go into some history and I hope that, you know, some people learn from this. And um, hopefully this will help you understand some of the political games that you will see being played out um, throughout the entire year up until this election cycle. And whether you are a Caucasian United States citizen or whether you are an indigenous American national. I would advise you not to get tricked 
by the Freemasons who are in the shadows playing both sides against each other. Okay. So you all stay tuned for the next one. We out.